this uh, webinar uh, brought to you by the Orthopedic Research and Education Foundation India. Uh, today we have uh, Dr. Janki Sharan Badani, the Secretary of the Orthopedic Research and Education Foundation, talking to us about health hazards in orthopedics. So I think this is an uh, uh, important topic uh, because we don't realize some of the occupational hazards uh, that we are in when we are involved in orthopedic surgery, and so, and uh, we would we would welcome Dr. Badani giving us his insights onto this uh, difficult problem. So over to you, Janki. Thank you very much, sir. So, sir, I'll share my. Sure. Yes. What happened? Just one minute, sir. Still. We have a blank screen in front of us. In just a minute. I'll just. Yes. You checked it out before, no? Yes, sir. Just now have checked it. So you need to um, yes. it again. Yes, sir. Just the switch switch off and switch on sir maybe ah that's yeah. what i thought you were yes. doing that yes Hmm. Want to start sharing your screen? Yes, sir. Yes. Yeah, better. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Sorry for slight delay. So, uh, So, so uh, my topic is about occupational hazards and safety measures in orthopedics. This is just one eye opener for a few of you and uh, uh, to change our attitude, what we learn from this talk is about the what is the 
occupational health actually it means that all aspects of the health and safety in your workplace and how we can prevent the risk so the learning objective of this talk is about the potential risk and the risk taking behavior we should know and how we can protect ourselves and our medical staff although there are uh, numerous organization in foreign countries as well as in india which is taking care of this like niosh that national institute of occupational safety uh, and health and usha then the food and drug administration central of disease control and prevention who etc so when i have checked the questions that is not directly related to this talk but it is a potential uh, topic which can be asked in your dnp exams so what is occupational hazards that means that any condition of the job that can result in illness or injury who classified it as seven types the common one is like biological chemical physical in physical you have radiation and noise hazards then ergonomic psychosocial and other things so about the biological hazards which can be of two types one is blood borne and another one is air borne like in blood borne we may have a needle stick injury which is quite common or because of the splash of blood and in air borne that is due to the covid 19 what we had faced recently the pandemic and the flu and other things so we should also know that there is a second most common route of blood borne infection is through our mucous membrane which is about 14% of that of the needle stick injury so there are guidelines which is for our cells that if will get infected then uh, we should know that in older days that we are no more in operative works but there are guideline if you are infected then you should keep the genome equivalent to a certain level limit of certain level so that the uh, viral load is less then you are able to you are allowed to operate and to do certain works in Uh, we should know that by the end of our training about 99% of surgical residents will have sustained at least one needle stick injury and it is also common in younger generation as you will get experienced these things will occur less commonly and the needle stick conversion of hbv is quite common it is up to 30% while for other things like hiv it is 0.3% so it's important to report it immediately so that even if the patient is uh, you are not knowing the status of the patient then also you should report it so that we can take care of you and uh, the post exposure prophylaxis what is available to the hospital should be given as early as possible to you so about the general surgeon there is data that at least about one injury per 100 hours of operative time they sustain and in the in the operative career about 200 injuries so about the post exposure prophylaxis there are good antiviral drugs are available for hiv which is at least two antiviral drug is recommended one with tenofovir and lamivudin or imsitabine although it is not uh, same everywhere like for the children it is a different one and you should have antiviral drug as early as possible ideally within 72 hours and you should adhere to the full course of 28 days for hepatitis b if you are not vaccinated or uh, you have not completed your vaccination then you should have one single dose of hepatitis b immunoglobulin with three dose of vaccine over 6 months for the prevention you should reduce the viral load in the patient when you are taking it to ot to educate our staff and our junior colleagues about hand free technique and how to wash up when you we are getting the needle stick injury you should take universal precaution we are 
uh, whenever you are not knowing the status of the uh, of the uh, hepatitis B or HIV of that patient, or if it is known that he is positive, you should also use double gloves and or with the thicker ortho gloves, and you should frequently change the outer gloves so that uh, you will have lesser chance even if uh, you are just having some uh, in uh, your glove is tear off in between and you are not knowing of. then you should use the sealed and you should have a sound slip also and should also have follow-up testing and prophylaxis available in your hospital about the airborne hazards like ventilation impairment because of the prolonged use of the mask and PPE in frontline COVID workers are quite common recently. And we have seen in few studies like uh, in Ong et al, there is 81% of uh, the associated headache and uh, other things like body ache and all because of elevated inhaled carbon dioxide with decreased oxygen level. So when we are using the full face respirator, it actually impair the ventilation after prolonged use. So the recommended level by the National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health uh, was set to 0.5% of the carbon dioxide and uh, the maximum up to 3%. So if it exceeds more than 4%, immediately it is dangerous to your life. For the health. So the other things like smoke when we are using the quadri or the ultrasound scalpel or laser it produces the smoke and when we compare it like one gram of the uh, tissue if it gets burned it produces up to six cigarette uh, it's equivalent to the smoke of the six cigarette uh, which is uh, so smoke contains the water vapor mainly and particulate matter. We are worried about particulate matter and other things like bacteria, viruses, and uh, different chemicals, which can be carcinogen, irritant, neurotoxin, like uh, toluidine, benzene, etc. So how we can reduce the smoke in our OT theater, theater by using the suction near its source or by having a filter trap, like few of the quadri have filter incorporated in it. So the other things on the chemical hazards is bone cement. When we are using it, uh, the liquid part is the our main concern because it is the causing the dermatological, pulmonary or neurological uh, problem. So WHO recommended to avoid direct skin contact with the liquid part, methyl methacrylate, and uh, uh, use it in well-ventilated area with recirculating air filter with gas absorbent of acid carbon. So even if we are taking the cement in our hand, it's uh, by the pores of the micro pores of the gloves, it can go into between your skin and the glove, which is you should take care that it is a carcinogen also. So you should not touch it directly. Then the physical hazard like noise and radiation. It is seen that in one study that about 50% of the orthopedic surgeon have some sort of deafness. And why it is so? Because we are using so many tools which produce noise, even the suction tip, which trap tissue, whistle up to 100 decibel. In the saw, drill, KY, these are producing the uh, noise, which is above recommended level. So what the guidelines suggest is to uh, have 85 decibel, up to 85 decibel of noise for not more than eight hours. So we should update our equipments and whenever possible change from pneumatic to battery power tool and you should have regular hearing test that is uh, that is can prevent your uh, hearing loss. And the radiation, what we are knowing is 
about X-ray and CM, what we are discussing here, but there are lots of radiation in the environment. And the CM or X-ray has developed a lot during the, if we compare it, what we were using previously, because of the collimis, collimation and the filtration, uh, which is incorporated in the CM. So we should know what radiation can cause what hazards or what health problem to us like when it produce both somatic and genetic problem it can produce erythema or weakness headache etc but in uh, long term it can produce bone marrow suppression even the telomere length is get shortened which produce early aging the carotid intima media thickness is increased so that you may have atherosclerosis early, early, and one very specific type of contract, which is known as posterior subscapular contract. So the risk is more if you are doing some close reduction or intramedullary nailing or some minimally invasive surgery where you are using the CM. And the patient factors, like if patient is obese or when you are uh, using it for the larger parts or whenever there is more fat in the patient, then it is more. If the technician is new, then without telling you about the uh, CM shoot, he can take uh, the CM picture so that in that way, it again increases your radiation. So the CM quality is also important, even the pregnancy, when uh, we are uh, telling about the pregnancy that we know that a few of the uh, females are also working in orthopedics and uh, that may when uh, she has uh, in first trimester baby is uh, it is quite dangerous the radiation is quite dangerous in that period so what is the maximum allowable radiation dose is uh, by the us radiation worker it is it should be less than 50 millisievert per year. Later in the Europe, it is said that it should be less than 20 uh, millisievert in a year. So the threshold for body, it is for the eye, it is about 150. For a skin, it is up to 500. So we should know that it is not uh, 500 millisievert is quite more. Like if we compare it with the uh, atom bomb which is uh, in the Hiroshima in 1945 that is uh, produced in the environment it is 500 to 1000 milli sievert so it is equal to that so how we can decrease the radiation dose by keeping ourselves little distant from the source and when we are using pulsatile radiation like uh, what we are using in our OT theater, that is pulsatile one, what the cardiologists are using continuous one, that is the fluoroscopy, that are more dangerous. Then we can use shielding by lead apron or the thyroid shield or the gloves, uh, which is uh, having lead gloves, that can reduce the dose. Then control the contamination. There is one term which is known as internal radiation. So uh, even if you keep your food near the radiation source, then that is also get contaminated. And when you are eating that one, that is also dangerous for you. Then you should have adequately trained operator and a personal dosimeter for everyone. And you should also know that how to put the dosimeter, then a regular orientation program in the hospital is also important. Other thing like uh, for the shielding, the lead apron reduce it up to one fourth to one sixteenth, and the lead goggles, what uh, very few of the orthopedic surgeon are using, reduces it up to thirty times. Then thyroid guard is reduces up to two point five times. I have searched for uh, what is the disadvantage of using thyroid guard. One thing what I found is that the operative field is contaminated by thyroid guard because it is probably a uh, little out of your 
tap run and another thing uh, what i found that you are getting more radiation towards your gonad when you are got you are using the thyroid card uh, then the smaller part you will get lower dose as i explained then uh, what i should uh, you should remember that when you compare the trauma surgeon with the spine surgeon uh, in the literature in 2021 it is written that uh, the spine surgeon are getting 5 to 10 times more than the trauma surgeon if they are operating almost equal then for what we are getting mainly is scattered radiation the direct radiation which patient is getting is uh, commonly what we are getting in our dominant hand which is the most common area where you get uh, the most of the radiation then how we can use that one one thing what uh, we, we can show here there is two parts of the cm one is x ray source and another one is the camera so the x ray source is where the arrow is pointing towards and the plate is on another side so it is important no, to know because uh, you should have more radiation behind the x ray source will in the next slide we can know why it is so because what we are getting is the reflected radiation when uh, we are using the x-ray tube is this side in the upper part upper side upper part of body are getting more reflected radiation than lower part of the body and most of the vital organ in the upper part of body so it's better to use it downward like when you are using the x-ray tube down then you are getting more radiation towards your leg and lesser to, towards your face. Then in one more thing uh, is by this picture is that it's better to avoid standing behind the x-ray tube because uh, there you can get more radiation, more reflected radiation towards that because it's get reflected from the patient or the bed. Then the radiation intensity decreases with the distance even you keep yourself one and half feet away from the beam you are getting just 0.1 percent of the radiation other thing which is important to know about ergonomic i am uh, explaining my patients when he comes with some low back ache or some neck pain to know about the ergonomic and uh, it's i think if you add in your practice that one by explaining that then it is of more value because because of posture we are getting more and more low back ache and cervical spine pain and other things also so what is ergonomic it is sign it, it is the science of fitting the job to the worker and it also uh, about the practice of designing equipments so what we can do to use the uh, ideal ergonomic is that you should keep the body in its most neutral position while working you should take short breaks of stretching use stool and foot rest there is one topic which is computer based ergonomic which is asked probably i'm not sure it is in the dnb or not uh, so that you should know like the monitor upper border of monitor should be at the level of your eye and there are many more things so you should read that and uh, what is more important is that poor ergonomy starts early in the surgeon's career and if we see about the orthopedic surgeon about 24 percent of us having cervical spine herniation and the, so the neck pain is quite common other things are also like uh, shoulder elbow and hand low back ache so if you are uh, you are following the ergonomic principles you'll have lesser problem then one more thing is what psychosocial problem there is lots of violence we are seeing in the news about the doctors other things is about the stress as you are getting promoted in your work you have more stress more emotional exhaustion there is if you have loaded shift and job stress that may also increase stress in the family then there is 
uh, you, how you can prevent this by employee social support program, which is common in foreign country, but in few of the few of the institution, probably in India. So the take home of this talk is to encourage the early reporting of injury and rotate the work that is physically tiring. So you should have a teamwork, learn techniques for reducing the stress and strain, maintain the clutter-free environment, and change and enforce rules whenever necessary and procedures. And you should know what are the risks and how we can reduce the risk. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Janki. Uh, I think there's a lot of useful information there. So any questions from any of the yes, postgraduates or DMBs? We'd be happy to take them. Maybe I have no idea that uh, what what uh, one thing suggests uh, because I have included that COVID-19 because recently there are few things which is asked in the recent past in the question paper. So what we are following, sir, in COVID-19, just a brief review. If... Who are you asking? Uh, for, it is for you, sir. You, are, you, you, are, you, are, you have to answer questions. You can't ask questions when you are. <laughs> so just for these things, sir, because, because so what, right now we are just screening for the antigen. That's all. Okay, sir. Okay, and because I think we went through a phase where we were doing uh, the COVID test for all of them. Yes, sir. Okay, and uh, obviously, if they were positive, there were certain precautions you had to take and avoid surgery that was not absolutely urgent or essential. Yes. But today, I think with the numbers coming down, although there's again reports of some rise in the numbers, uh, the only test we do is a rapid antigen test to screen them. We're not doing the RT-PCR test as a routine for all our patients. Yes, sir, sir, there are multiple paper that time that says that uh, because of bone dust also we are getting COVID-19, although later when I inquired about that one, that is, uh, I think, not, not true. It is just airborne, probably because yeah, of... So there were a lot of things. Uh, I think if you go through the two or three years of COVID that has been there, everything that was suggested in the beginning has turned out to be false okay yes. so everything from what the who claimed uh, from starting with the origins itself that it was not a human to human contact to that travel did not spread it etc uh, the medications that initially came in like uh, the combination of uh, hydroxyquinolone and as a so uh, azithromycin, I think um, it caused more harm than actually helped people. Okay, even the antiviral drugs, uh, remdesivir, etc., have not really been shown to help in a majority of cases. <clears throat> uh, the use of things like ivermectin. Again, which became very popular, which essentially is an anti helminthic used more for it's horses heavy. and dogs than human beings. Yes. So I think uh, now the present uh, trend is proclovid, which we don't know whether uh, long term it will stand the test of time. You had all these gamma globulins and uh, from patients who had got infected with it and things like that. but plasma therapy, etc. I think none of them has really stood the test of time. The only drug which had some role, which has remained constant, has been steroids. That too in only certain situations. Okay, so I think uh, we are still not sure about what we are dealing with and we are still learning as we go along. 
Yes, sir. And just one more thing, sir, that uh, any change in the like uh, problem which is increased in your uh, OPD, sir, when you, because you have seen because so of we are, no, I don't think so. I mean, for us, I mean, yes, of course, you're seeing a lot more avian. Uh, many of them have had steroids, but we also see some patients who have had COVID but have not had steroids, or at least they claim not to have steroids, who got ABN. Uh, arthritis, joint pains, generalized body pains. Uh, that's again something some of the people get after some time. And of course, you have the other cardiac issues and neurological issues, uh, which uh, are uh, fairly well discussed. Um, you have people, so this cardiac problems, I think, especially in the uh, second wave, it was found that many people died after they had recovered when they went, out, went to do strenuous exercises because they had some kind of cardiomyopathy or myocarditis, which hadn't completely settled down. So I think there's, uh, it's a... Uh, uh, virus which we still don't fully understand yes so i think so okay no questions for many yes. of the so all of them are very well versed are there just the question one question is that about the surgical mask that we use are not protective from smoke generated by cautery and particulate matter yes it is protective because as i told that even one gram of the uh, tissue burned can produce six, six that smoke equivalent to six cigarette, but we are not getting it because of the mask. Mask can protect the particulate matter to a large extent. So, yeah, but yes, I think uh, so. That is why I keep saying that don't use diatomy where it is not necessary. Okay. The surgery, surgery should mostly be done with the knife. Of course, there are certain situations. And for uh, leaders where you have to use uh, cautery or uh, certain situations where you're taking muscle or bone where you use uh, cautery, but avoid using cautery where it's not really necessary. Use the knife. Yeah, I think so we just... tend to use minimal cautery in our, whenever I'm operating anyway. Yes. But the just... younger, younger surgeons are sold to cautery. Just one thing, sir, that uh, it is important to know that that surgical smoke is also known as bovi smoke. They can ask if by the name of bovi smoke also in your so Bovi is the cautery, this thing, no? Uh, probably why that? In, in, in the US, they call it bovi. So that's why they call it bovi smoke. Okay, <laughs> I'm not sure, sir. That's what they call it, yeah. Okay, sir. So, okay. Think, so thank you very much. And... Uh, so until next week and uh, yes, okay. Thank you very much, sir. Sure. Thank and you. We have our next meeting at eight o'clock now. Ah uh, yes, sir. Eight o'clock. Okay. Thank you. Sir. Sure. Okay. Bye. Bye.